Good morning to you all. I hope you're doing well at this time and have had a good week. Uh, the weather is lovely where I am. Hopefully it is the same with you too. This is the service for the 28th of June. Our theme of service is hospitality. Our call to worships from Romans 15, 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Our opening hymn of praise comes from Complete Mission Praise 37, As the Deer Pants for the Water. Please sing along with me, As the Deer Pants for the Water. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You're my friend, and you're my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I hope you enjoyed singing that along with me. Let us now make our prayers of approach and confession to the Lord, as well as the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we turn away from the preoccupation with our own thoughts, prejudices and desires. Please help us to cast aside our own self-centeredness and find our true centre in you. Bring us to the point where we discard the second rate and focus in giving you sincere and joyful praise. Loving God, we confess we do not live in the style of Jesus. Too readily we adapt ourselves to others who do not live by a faith. We confess we have not made the most of our faith. In our busy lives, we have not made time for reflection and prayer. You remain at the edges of our lives rather than at the centre. We confess we have searched for you in remarkable situations where you exist in the ordinary and the everyday. We confess we have not been fair to ourselves. We have not displayed our strengths for all to see, or have been too afraid our faith would be mocked. Let us all now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have you ever seen a welcome mat? Where have you seen something like this? Usually we'd see a mat like this outside the door to our homes, wouldn't we? 
A mat such as this usually has two purposes. Do you know what these two purposes are? Well, for one thing, it is a friendly reminder for people to wipe their shoes off so that they won't track dirt or mud into the home. And second, it is placed outside your door as a sign to let people know that they are welcome in your home. Welcome. What does the word welcome mean? It means to receive someone in a warm and friendly way. Are people always welcome in our homes? Do we welcome people into our home if their skin is a different colour from ours? Do we welcome people into our homes if they don't have as much money as we do? How about in our church? Do you think that we make everyone feel welcome in our church? Do we speak to those people who are visiting our church that we do not know? If someone comes to our church and they are not dressed the way we are dressed, do we make sure that they are made to feel welcome? Jesus said, he who receives you receives me. If we turn that around, we will understand that if we do not welcome others into our homes and into our churches, it is the same as if we are refusing to welcome Jesus. Now, we wouldn't do that, would we? Well, let's put the welcome mat out and let's be sure that we mean it. Let us pray. Dear Father, help us to remember that when we refuse to welcome others to our homes and to our church, it is the same as refusing to welcome you. Amen. Our first reading comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, reading from verses 40 to 42. So St Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, reading from verses 40 to 42, reading from the New International Version of the Bible. So let us hear the word of God. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading of his holy word. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans. Chapter 6, reading from verses 12 to 23. So Romans chapter 6, reading from verses 12 to 23. Again, reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And let us hear the word of God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace, slaves to righteousness. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that, though you are used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. 
you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and thanks be to God for these readings of his holy word and to him be all glory and praise. Our sermon is entitled, Welcoming People to God. The great philosopher Plato once said, No one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. So don't shoot the messenger. In Matthew's short passage of Jesus' words, he is describing a way Jews generally spoke. For the Jew receiving a person's envoy was like receiving the dignitary himself. Respecting the messenger was like respecting the dignitary's message. The rabbis believed greeting the learned was like greeting God himself. Do we give the same respect to all? Those who convey God's message, do we prefer to speak with God ourselves and ignore the messenger? How then will we know what God wants us to do? We must listen intently to the messenger to hear the message delivered. There are four elements to salvation which connect with each other. God's love for us begins the process of salvation. God's Son, Jesus, then lived and died to save us all from sin. The prophet and the disciple then passed on the good news to others. The believer then welcomes God and his message into their lives. We need God at all times in our lives, but particularly in times of crisis such as this and such as we have today. Not all of us can be prophets and preach the gospel, but each of us who welcomes the prophet at our doors will be equally rewarded. The greatest public figures could not have achieved their greatness on their own. Often there is a private figure in the background who made the public figure's achievements possible. The prophet needs food, clothes, his or her children looked after someone he or she trusts completely. The person who does these things will be equally rewarded by God because without them, the public figure could not preach the gospel, could not write a book, could not direct a film, could not be that sports star. We cannot all be completely virtuous, but those who help the good person will be rewarded just as the virtuous person is rewarded. Let me illustrate this with a beautiful story told by H.L. Gay. There was a young man in a village in the country who, after a great struggle, entered the ministry. The village cobbler helped the student be successful in his studies. The cobbler was a man of intelligence himself. Eventually, the young man became a minister. The cobbler himself wanted to be a minister, but his circumstances did not allow this. He was so happy that this man was achieving what the cobbler hoped to achieve. The cobbler decided to make him a pair of shoes for free, so he would wear them and stand in his shoes whilst he preached. The cobbler and the preacher served God in the same way and would be rewarded just the same. 
We do not all have the ability or knowledge to teach children, but we can help them in other ways. We can teach them about our life experience. However, the little ones described by Matthew were what the rabbis called their disciples as they were always learning and their knowledge was small but hopefully growing. The church will always need great speakers and great teachers, but will also need those who provide other forms of service such as hospitality. All these people serve Christ in different ways and all will be viewed equally by God. All help the establishment and the advancement of Christ's kingdom on earth. How hospitable are we and are we hospitable for the right reasons? Two acquaintances spent three days together. You have a pretty place here, John, said Bill on the morning of his departure. But it looks quite bare outside. Oh, that's because the trees are so young, answered John. I hope they'll have grown to a good size before you come again. Hopefully, we can be more hospitable hosts and put our guests better at their ease than John did. We have to remain sensitive to others when they visit our homes so they might want to return. From Paul's letter to the Romans, we learn Christianity is not simply an emotional experience, but a practical way of living. We should not just reflect about it in church every Sunday, but use our Christian faith to battle those who want to deny us our faith. Our faith encourages us, particularly during this time of lockdown. Paul considers sin as a weapon of evil. God needs all of us to fight against sin. We do this by preaching God's word and by obeying him. If God wants a person encouraged to do good, we can only do this through God. Similarly, a person will lapse into sin if he is led astray by another. Which side are we on? God's side or the side of evil? We were dead but are now alive. We respond to Christ's grace rather than follow the law. God is less a judge, more a lover of our souls. Every person who is loved wants to improve themselves. Following the law does not free us from sin, but the desire not to disappoint someone who loves us. The law makes us fear, whilst God brings us love. God's free grace to us tempts us. We can sin as much as we like and God always forgives us. Why should we worry about sin? Let us just enjoy ourselves. How does Paul respond to his critics? He says, once you were the slave to sin, but now you are the slave to righteousness. A slave in Paul's time, unlike a servant today, could not have two masters. The servant had his free time. The slave was bound to his master 24-7. Paul did not like comparing slavery with being a Christian. However, the advantage of this comparison was as a Christian, you cannot have two masters. Only God can be your master. No true Christian can keep part of his life away from God. He must give God all his life. Paul tells the church in Rome they chose freely to obey in the way that they did. Here he is referring to adult baptism, which existed in the early church and being admitted to the church through a confession of faith. People were not admitted to the church just because they wanted to join. When a man wanted to join the Benedictine Order of Monks, he was given a year's probation. During this time, all his clothes he wore on the outside world hanged or hung in his cell. At any time, he could remove his monk's habit, put his regular clothes back on and rejoin society. Once the probationary year had passed, the clothes were removed from the cell and he was officially part of the Benedictine order. 
Paul differentiated between the old life and the new one. The old life was the pagan life where anything goes. Complete immorality. We may pause before we lapse into sin, but then we become helpless. It controls us. Our sinfulness increases as we constantly seek that greater thrill. In this context, we may think of the petty criminal who begins to shoplift, but who then moves on to armed robbery. The greater thrill is constantly sought. The new life was defined by the Greeks as giving to God what is owed to him. It is a road to sanctification. It is not a road which ends. The struggle to remain righteous continues. Everyone should have a positive goal in life, even if that goal is never achieved. As Robert Louis Stevenson has said, to travel, hopefully, is a better thing than to arrive. Paul concludes, the price of sin is death. But God freely gives us eternal life through our faith in Jesus Christ. We must always choose God and Christ over sin, as it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That famous reading from Galatians. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Let us now make our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession to God, so let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for our beautiful planet and all the creatures you have made for us to enjoy including ourselves. We thank you for calling us into faith and into service. We thank you that we are friends of the earth and stewards of its bounty. We thank you that you brought your son Jesus Christ into the world to accept our sins. We thank you that we belong to the church where Christ exists as love. We thank you we are now reconciled with God. We thank you that death has lost its sting and the grave its victory. We pray for the young and strong who are full of hope. We pray for the elderly and weak whose hope might be gone. We pray for the wise and generous who search for new challenges. We pray for the foolish and selfish who avoid their responsibilities. We pray for the peacemakers who search for peace. We pray for the warmongers who react in violence. We pray that the fortunate share their good fortune. We pray that the homeless and the hungry are not forgotten. We pray for the patients who are willing to wait. We pray for the impatient who are not. We pray for the healthy and happy, as well as the sick and the dying. We pray for the faithful and the faithless our friends and families, as well as our enemies and strangers. We pray for the coronavirus patients, their families and all who attend to their needs. We pray for the scientific community as they strive to develop a vaccine. We pray we continue to act responsibly as the lockdown gradually eases and do not lose our faith as a result. All these prayers we ask in your name, Lord. Amen. Our final hymn comes from CH4, uh, number 198. Let us build a house where love can dwell. So CH4198, let us build a house where love can dwell, and please sing along with me.
Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Build of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vaults of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true. Where all God's children dare to seek, to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love is found in water, wine and wheat. A banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Here the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ the feast that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the wood and stone. To heal and strengthen, serve and teach, and live the word they've known. Hear the outcast and the stranger, bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed, as words within the word. Built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from roof to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Thank you so much for saying that along with me. Let us now say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this act of worship this morning. I hope you all have a good week, and I will see you uh, at the same time next week. Thank you and goodbye.